you have found what lights you up. I'm your host, Sunny the Life Coach, and I'm here because I see you searching for something or someone out there to help you feel better, something to take away the pain that you're feeling, the inadequacies. I know all of the things that happen in life can leave you feeling empty. Your search is over. This podcast is all about finding your own freedom and power to love yourself enough to shine in the ways you were always meant to, the ways in which you are already fully capable of. If you're ready for some real talk, some serious truth bombs, and a few F-bombs, you are in the right place. Let's do this. Let's get lit. Hey there, and welcome to a very special episode that I am so honored to be sharing with you. Today, I am having a conversation with author Laura Davis about her latest book, The Burning Light of Two Stars, a mother-daughter story. This book was just released on November 9th, hot off the presses. We're going to talk about some of the things contained within the book without giving away too many spoilers because it truly is a must read. As one of the testimonials by Carol Berry says, this is a must read for every daughter estranged from her mother, every grown child struggling with a sibling, every clenched tight heart that hungers to open. Oh, that sums it up so very well. I think on some level, mother-daughter relationships can become contentious for many of us. Sometimes there is a separation, either physical or emotional, perhaps both. And we navigate that connection or disconnection from our mothers in ways that both challenge and change us. And Laura is an author by profession and is well known for co-authoring The Courage to Heal with Ellen Bass in 1988, which is about healing from child sexual trauma. In so doing, she exposed her maternal grandfather for having abused her, which created a deep wedge with her mother. So in her latest book, which took her 10 years to write, She is sharing the story of estrangement, reconciliation, and the depths of the love that she and her mother held for one another, even in the darkest moments. Laura ended up caring for her mother through dementia and end of life while she was still working through her own healing, raising her children and working. Yes, she is a card-carrying member of the Sandwich Generation. In many ways, this book is an expression of that healing. It is vulnerable and raw. It is authentic and true and such a powerful story. Those are Sonny's words. (laughs) And through reading it, I realized fully how it took so long to complete. She is literally taking you along on her journey and her experiences as she is processing visceral emotions. She doesn't make herself the hero of the story, nor the victim, even though she shares the ways in which she was harmed. I truly feel that Laura humanized herself as well as her mother. There is serious depth to this story. Okay, I'm not going to make this intro too long because we talked for over an hour and the time just flew by. Just a couple more things about Laura the human. She writes books that change people's lives. She is the author of six nonfiction books, and as her bio states, her latest book, The Burning Light of Two Stars, is her first memoir. In her words, it tells the story of my dramatic and tumultuous relationship with my mother from the time of my birth until her death from a much more dramatic, intimate, and personal point of view. It gives a no holds barred peek at the real me, the woman behind the teacher, the facilitator, the author. End quote. 
I believe this conversation is also a glimpse into the real Laura Davis. So let's get to it. Welcome, Laura, to the podcast. Thank you so much for being with us today. I'm thrilled to be here and can't wait to talk with you. Oh, I love it. What lights you up? What lights me up? Uh, my grandchildren, absolutely. Um, and uh, their innocence. You know, I think there's so much um, to be frightened about in the world right now, so much uncertainty. Mm-hmm. And there's something about the the joy of children and the innocence of children that for me really lights me up. Um, that and I have, I have a new puppy. We got a pandemic puppy in oh. January. Um, and I've never been a dog person before, but um, my wife really wanted a dog. And yeah. I finally said yes. And I've fallen in love with this puppy. And oh. so, you know, just like having to take her out and run around with her and how she takes in the world, sniffs everything. There, it, so it's, you know, it's these beings that I'm around that are not worried. I think <laughs> they give me yes. a lot of hope. Yes, babies and puppies and kittens and all of them. They are just amazing. Awesome. What kind of puppy? Uh, she's the yellow lab. Mm. It, Labs are the best. They really are. They are. <laughs> all, all puppies are. All puppies well, are. Our, the only other dog I've ever had was a pit bull, actually. Uh, my son got this pit bull when he was uh-huh. in college, and then he moved back to California, where, where I live, and he couldn't, any place he tried to rent would not have, let him have a dog. So we ended up adopting his pit bull. And it, that was the best dog ever. I mean, what an amazing dog. Um, they are. But, you know, they are. He died, my- he died about, I don't know, six or seven years ago. And so uh, oh my, my goodness. partner was just jonesing for a new dog. And I finally said, yes. <laughs> Oh, six or seven years without a dog is a long time without a dog. I, you know, yes, congratulations to you for um, your your puppy. And yes, pit bulls are um, actually nanny uh, dogs, as my husband says. Yeah, he I said they are that. nanny dogs. They will take care of your children. They will snuggle and cuddle with your children like no other dog will. They, they are- change diapers. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> so great. How old are your grandchildren? I'm um, they now. are five, almost eight, and 19. Mm. Mm. Wow, that's fantastic. Okay, so we are going to have a conversation today about your latest book. You are a writer by profession. It is not a Uh, side gig. It is not something that you do for fun. It is what you do. And your latest book is The Burning Light of Two Stars. Oh my gosh. Can you tell me in your own words what this book is about? It's about the embattled relationship uh, I had with my mother, uh, our determination to love one another, and the dramatic surprising collision course we ended up on at the end of her life. Mm. Um, for the millions of readers of my first book, which was The Courage to Heal, this this book, I consider it like the prequel and the sequel. Yeah. And it, it reveals in intimate detail how I reconciled with the mother who had betrayed me and came to care for her at the end of her life. Mm. Yeah, your mom, you invited your mother to into your life to, you know, into her end of life experience, if you will, you said, come live with me, mom. And then one day she called you up and said, okay, I'm ready to come. Yeah. And I, I certainly never, you know, the moment I invited her, it, it was never to live with me. I knew that I could never live with her literally in the same house or the same apartment. Mm-hmm. I think we both knew that that would never work. Um, but it was really in a in an incredible moment of I don't know like I, I almost want to say spirit spoke through me and I don't usually talk that way but mm-hmm. it was this bubble that rose up inside me and invited her in a moment totally unexpected I didn't mm-hmm. think about it at all and then nothing happened for ten years and I totally I just forgot about it I mean I I assumed it would never happen you know she kept living her life three thousand miles away yeah um, and so when she called me. Uh, when she was 79 years old and said she was moving to Santa Cruz, my town, I was in an absolute state of shock and panic. Mm -hmm. Because my relationship with my mother at that point 
it worked because there was a certain cushion of distance between us. Yeah. And like like coast I, to coast distance, right? She, <laughs> yeah, really. I've always said I moved as far away as I could get without crossing an ocean. She was and, on the and east coast. She was yeah. on the east coast. I was yeah. on the west coast. Yeah. Yeah. So I I I just didn't think, didn't know if I could possibly become the daughter she needed me to be because our history was so mm -hmm. bleak and difficult. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of boundaries and rules where she was concerned to even have any kind of relationship with her. And suddenly mm -hmm. I was going to be, have this proximity to her and our, our power dynamic was shifting. You know, she was aging and I was becoming the person that had control. It was a, it was a huge challenge. And um, part of me wanted to run away from it, but you know, another part of me hoped that I would not fail, that I could succeed and that possibly, possibly finally have the kind of mother daughter relationship that I had always secretly longed for, even though I was pushing her away. Oh, what would failure have been for you, Laura? Failure would have been um, that I couldn't show up as her caregiver, um, mm -hmm. that I would abandon her, um, that I would be angry at her. Well, of course, I did get angry at her, so not that. I guess that I would abandon her or just that that I, my life would fall apart. I, I was really concerned that the life that I had constructed, you know, I had my wife, my children, my business, my teaching, my writing, mm -hmm. my friends, my community, all of that was structured on this independence and separation from her. I mean, I wouldn't have said this at the time, mm -hmm. um, but I had a certain equilibrium and I was really worried that it would all fall apart when she yeah. arrived. Yeah, yeah. Oh, all right. So we are just jumping straight into the deep end with this conversation, which I absolutely love. But let's back it up a little bit because uh, you, I have had the privilege of getting an advanced copy of your book, uh, your latest, and, uh, you know, that is about this relationship. Now, I do want to talk just ever so briefly about the courage to heal. What is that book about? The Courage to Heal is a book I wrote with Ellen Bass. Uh, we, we published it in 1988. So it's been 33 years mm -hmm. since that book came out, 35 mm -hmm. years since we started writing it. Mm -hmm. um, I was 28 years old when I started writing that book. It I was 31 when it was published. And Ellen and I wrote a guidebook for women who had been sexually abused as children. And mm -hmm. it was really the first book that talked about how to heal. Yeah. At, at that point, there had started to be some books um, that were really breaking the silence that this even existed. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ellen had actually written a book earlier called I, I Never Told Anyone. Um, and that was just women's, it was an anthology of women telling their story, first person stories about sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. And so that book had kind of broken all this new ground. And her publisher, uh, which was Harper and Rowe at the time, wanted her to write a sequel about healing. Because it's one thing to break silence about something, but then if this terrible, terrible thing has happened to you, what can you do about it? And, yeah. and I think at that point, the, the idea was that, you know, if this has happened to you, your life is ruined. You're, you're damaged and you're never going to recover. Mm. And so The Courage to Heal was a book that was really a beacon for millions of women saying, this is the pathway from, if this has happened to you, this is how this is the way out. Yeah. This is how you could heal. This is how you can reclaim your life. Mm -hmm. Here are the steps. This is the healing process. Mm -hmm. So that's what that book was. It was a huge book, 600 pages. It was full of women's stories, a great diversity of women. And it was written in very simple, clear, um, compassionate language. And it really, uh, not like therapeutic language or yeah. abstract language. It wasn't right. intellectual. It really spoke from the heart to the heart. And it it came out, it became this huge grassroots bestseller. And th this was, you know, before the internet. So this was not because it was on, uh, you know, Facebook or LinkedIn. There, there weren't, you know, Snapchats about it. There, it was, it was just like on bulletin boards and it was yeah. just passed from hand to hand to hand. And um, it just, it, it's really started um, a movement of, empowerment for sexual abuse survivors. And, 
you know, I look at it now and I think of it, you know, it's it's in a lineage of many other movements that have been created for uh, the empowerment of people who are oppressed. And yeah. this was a, a really significant moment in that pathway forward. And, you know, Me Too right now is, you know, the, the path is continuing beyond our book, but it's really the same thread of mm -hmm. how do we empower people uh, who have been victimized, who have been abused, who have been held down, who have been oppressed, and how can they regain their power? So that, that's what that book was. And it, it you know, it, it's interesting when it first came out, I think Ellen and I had this really naive idea. If we just write about it, it'll stop. Uh, yes. you know? And we thought, okay, this book will be around for a little while. And then, you know, the, once we draw attention to this problem, people will do something about it and it will stop. And unfortunately, you know, now many generations of women later are still using the courage to heal. And I'm glad it's there as a resource. Uh, we've updated it a lot as we've learned more about trauma and healing. Mm -hmm. But I'm also really sad that this is continuing. Yeah. You know, that there's there's more victims, there's more people being abused all the time and more people having to, you know, basically go to where the, they're broken and fix it. You know, and, and sometimes I feel like we can be stronger in the broken places, but I absolutely would rather not have been broken at all. And I think, you know, mm -hmm. anyone in this position would prefer that they had a, you know, a healthy, whole, empowering childhood, but many of us don't get that. I love that. I would rather not have been broken at all. Yeah. I mean, I think that we can all identify with that on some level even if it isn't the same level that you're talking about, because when I first met you, I told you that I hadn't read that book and your response was. I'm really glad that you didn't need to. <laughs> that is a beautiful, beautiful thing. However, it is also a beautiful thing that you are willing to be vulnerable and put that out into the world, put that work out into the world. And that played into actually partially your separation with your mother, right? I mean, that, that book did play into that because you bared your soul and you, you know, you put things out there. I haven't read that one, but how did it come to be that here we are, you were, you know, she's what, 79, you said? When, when she, she, yeah, when, yeah. She, when she announced her that she was coming for the Yeah, rest of her life. yeah, she announced that she was coming to move, <laughs> you know, move from one coast to the other and live the rest of her days with you. And you were like, what do I do with this? Well, you know, this is really interesting because a bunch of years before, when we were, when she, we, she and I were at the height of our estrangement, I mean, just not speaking to each other and mm -hmm. obsessed with each other, but from afar, you know, and I was um, desperate for her to acknowledge and validate that her, it was her father had sexually abused me. Mm -hmm. And she was just as desperate for me to recant. And neither one of us yeah. were going to change our positions. You know, yeah. I mean, I had already published. I mean, there was there was no way I was going back. And and she right. wasn't capable is what I you know ultimately realized of, mm -hmm. of acknowledging what had happened to me. Mm -hmm. um, and my brother and I uh, went hiking in Rocky Mountains. He was living in Colorado at the time. We went for a big, he and I always hiked together. We went on a big hike together. And I said, and our parents were divorced. They had yeah. gotten divorced when I was a teenager. My father had come out to California to become a hippie. And my brother and I had this conversation and I said, there's no way I can take care of mom when she gets old. I said, mm -hmm. I'll take dad, you take mom. And we <laughs> made this pact. Um, and of course, you know, what happened was I did take care of my father for, for the end of his life. And when he died, um, and then when, my, when it was my mother, who was it on? It was on the girl, you know, it was on the daughter. Yeah. And my brother suddenly was not available, you know, yeah. for a lot of reasons. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I really never thought I could or wanted to be in the position of ever caring for her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you talk about your brother, Paul, in the book. Um, you talk about that relationship about, you know, uh, negotiating, if you will, who's going to do what in this, uh, this end of life experience. But I want to share before we go 
much further into this uh, conversation. I want to share for our audience that um, the reason, part of the reason that I connect to this so much is that my great grandmother and my grandmother have had Alzheimer's at end of life. And, you know, my mother is still living. She's, she's 72, but we are you just. You make her sound like she's ancient. I know. No, no, not at all. It's not ancient. No, 72. She's great. She's great. She has her herd of goats on her farm. I mean, she's happy. She's happy, happy, happy. Um, I, I just, but I, there are so many passages in the book that you wrote that remind me of my great grandmother and my grandmother. Like, so there are dualities if you will in my experience of the two the the elder is uh was very my experience of her was very angry and chaotic my experience of my grandmother when she was going through um alzheimer's and dementia was that she was very childlike and sweet for the first time the sweetest the sweetest human being I had ever known from her because she was not like that before. Right. So I want to share that with you and with everyone in that, that is a lot of what I'm connecting with is kind of reconciling all of that and understanding that just those little snapshots that I saw of the two of them as they went through their journey and they were snapshots. You got to live it like 24 seven, you and Karen and, you know, your, your entire family got to live it when your mother moved, not in with you, but near you so much closer to you than, you know, that, that space. So I just wanted to share that, that, that is the reason why I cried so much <laughs> while I was reading this. It's it's such a uh, such a deep um, yet uh, just it it it's deep. It's intense, and it is very. This is how it is. This is how it is. This is how you are expressing this relationship with your mother. And I just love that you have shared that with the world. You know, it's interesting. Uh, early on, uh, when I had like an early draft of this book, I uh, was writing in the car with a friend of mine who has was a creative writing professor for 30 years and uh, was kind of famous for her um, harsh critiques and she had read a bunch of pages of my book and she just started saying to me that um she felt it was superficial and um that i i was protecting myself and making myself look good and she said to me she said laura this book is not the courage to heal it is the courage to reveal and she said she said readers want you to be real on the page they want you to be human they want you to be able to make fun of yourself she said you don't let your real personality shine through she said this feels like a another self-help book disguised as a memoir that's what she told me and i was so devastated by her feedback i didn't talk to her for months but you know and i actually abandoned the book at that point because i just mm-hmm. thought i can't i can't do it i'm not capable and months later the story kept calling me it would not let me go and mm-hmm. When I got back to it, I put on my wall a sign that said, this is the courage to reveal. And Mm. from that point on, I really decided that I was going to show up on the page, that I was going to show um, my ugly sides, my rage, um, the times I, you know, was cruel or mean to my mother, the times I was wonderful, and that I was going to really show what it was really like, that I was, I was no longer going to make myself the hero of the story. Mm-hmm. And, and, and just in the same way, I didn't want my mother to be a villain either. I mean, she okay. did betray me at the worst moment of my life. And that, that really had a huge impact on me for, for decades, actually. Yeah. But the truth is, she was a very complex woman. You know, she was selfish. Um, 
she could be um, cruel, but she could be generous and loving and funny and um, magnanimous. And, and she had so many qualities. And I really wanted to show her complexity and I wanted to show my complexity. And, and I, I think that's one reason it took me 10 years to write this book is that I had to get to the point where we were both these fully three-dimensional, complicated characters who were both struggling to love each other despite so many obstacles and so many impediments. And we, we both had so many reasons to never speak again. Yeah. And yet there was something, I, I don't even know what it is. I can't say what it was now, but we were both driven to keep trying to connect with each other. And, I, you know, I think it took both of us having this amazing persistence and it showed up in different ways on both sides. Yeah. Uh, and it took, you know, it took the, 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 the book starts with my birth and ends with her death. Uh, yeah. So that's 57 years. And it took 57 years for us to sort this relationship out. Yeah. And you did that, though. You did that. You were able to convey that. I definitely uh, could. I could love your mother. I could love you. I could love every single person that you brought in to that story because you made them real and raw. So I want to touch on a couple of things uh, that you mentioned in the book. You don't spend a lot of time on your childhood in, in this book, but you do have, you know, just these moments that you bring in. And I want to, I want to talk about the fact that you went to Woodstock as a teenager oh my god yes i, I did. love it i love it and i'm I was, sure I was 13 you were 13, 13 years old 13 years mm -hmm. old my son will be 13 in a couple of months and i'm just like what that's crazy however uh you know it's one of those things that you look back on and you think oh that was a great experience to you that was just kind of like mm. i mean what was well, it like yeah well i went with my parents, which is even more bizarre. Right. You know, I, right. I said my father, it was about a year after that Woodstock that my father left New Jersey where he was a music teacher mm -hmm. um, and, and dropped out and moved to California. And first he went to the Esalen Institute for like a encounter group. And he, he just was trying to find himself, you know, he, and he became a hippie, you know, and he, he ended up founding this, um, Art, art colony in San Francisco called Project Arto. He was one of the original people. It's one of the first live work spaces for artists in the country. Mm -hmm. um, so he, he was a pretty interesting character, definitely a character. Um, and so he was the one who kind of, he, we lived in New Jersey and in the New York Times that summer, there were these full page ads for Woodstock. And they had really interesting art. My dad was an artist too. Yeah. And, he, and we would look at it every Sunday. I think it was in the Sunday New York Times. And it would be like, yeah. he'd say, I want to go to that. And my mother was like, no way. But he, he won out. And uh, my brother was off. I think he was off. You know, he was older than me. And I think he was at some other rock festival that summer. Mm -hmm. And it was my parents and me. Um, and actually my best friend who I, I didn't put in the book because I, she was an extraneous character, but it mm -hmm. was my best friend and me and my parents. Oh, wow. And we, we drove up to Woodstock, you know, which was, I don't know, maybe a four or five hour drive. And then there was all this, we were just in this grid of traffic. Mm -hmm. And what I remember, I don't remember that much, but I remember being stuck in traffic, like just a total grid, gridlock. And there was this guy walking up and down and he's going, I got the A. I got the A. He was selling oh acid. Oh, God, acid, yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> but that, that's what I remember. And then we went, and I, yeah. I remember the music. You know, I, I saw Sly yeah. and the Family Stone. I saw Janis Joplin perform. Oh. I saw Jimi Hendrix sing The Sunrise. <gasps> no and way. I, and it was just, yeah, it was incredible. But, but I also was, you know, I was with the first night my mother went. And then she was so horrified by the whole scene. She stayed at the campground where we were. And, and I went back with my dad and my friend the second night. Mm -hmm. um, and we stayed up all night. And, you know, there was like people were passing joints. And my dad was smoking. And I was like kind of horrified. I, I was mostly like a horrified observer. You know, it was just I was 13. You were 13 I was right. I was kind of shocked by the whole thing. And um, but, you know, I remember it. And I, I, I've gotten so much street cred you know, for so many years. And my mother too, she, for years later, she'd say, I was at Woodstock. I mean, yeah. she hated the whole experience, Yeah, but, yeah. but it definitely was, a, was a badge of honor um, yeah. to have attended. 
Yeah. I mean, isn't that amazing? Because again, in the moment, it's like, okay, this is, this is just nuts in the moment. But now it is like the most epic freaking concert you could have ever been a part of. And, you know, you and your mom were there <laughs> together. Yeah, yeah it's interesting. And, and I, I often give my um, writing students, um, I think objects are really powerful to write about. Sometimes mm -hmm. when we're writing, we can't really write directly about something that's difficult. But if you pick an object connected to it, mm -hmm. it's like an entry point. It's like mm -hmm. an oblique entry. And so I often will tell people, make a list of things that you have not, you, you've moved at least three times, like objects. Or if you if you haven't moved that you've held on to for 20 or 30 years. Mm. And on my list is an original Woodstock t-shirt that my father bought at Woodstock. And it's too small for me. I mean, it's like a, a, a it's a size small, but I've kept it for, you know, all these years. Yeah. In fact, I, I after he died, I found it in his things and I've kept it ever since. And I, no matter where I go, I'm going to have that shirt tucked in the bottom of my drawer. Oh, that <laughs> I is should so... probably frame it, you know. I you actually really went on, I went on, um, I went on eBay to see if I could sell it. I just wanted to see what it was worth. And actually, yeah. there were tons of knockoff shirts. Uh, and I found out it wasn't, it was mostly a sentimental value for me. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, let's also talk about the fact that your mother was an actress. She was yes. a performer. And you on it, the stage and in life. For sure. Yes, right, right. That's what I'm that's what I'm getting at. I, I want to get to one of the other childhood stories that you shared was uh, that I can relate to is that your mother had a dinner party with her friends at one point. Um, and yeah, I again, you were a teenager, maybe maybe 14, 15 ish. And um, she asked you, you know, she she just asked you at the end of that, you know, hey, perform this monologue or something of that nature. You know, she just put you on the stage in front of her friends. Yeah, that was a pretty common occurrence. I had, um, you know, okay. I think we often imitate our parents and I, uh -huh. I had joined um, and I loved speech and I had won, just won the speech arts festival. Uh -huh. um, at, at Long Branch High School in New Jersey yeah. uh, for dramatic interpretation. And, you know, she was just my accomplishments were her accomplishments, you mm -hmm. know, like she, mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. I did was, you know, reflecting on her good or yeah. bad, you know, so she kind of owned me. And I remember that night and she, um, she basically forced me to perform. And I, I did because I, you know, it's like no one else knew I had to, but I knew by the way she was looking at me and yeah. this pressure on my arm that I had better do it. And I kind of dissociated while I did it. You know, I was, but I did it. I, you know, I, I performed the thing and, and it was actually, um, it was one of the first times I tried to stand up to her after she did that to me. You mm -hmm. know, I tried to, it, it took me many, many years to be able to have enough life force to come up against her very big dominant energy. And that was one of the first times I tried to stand up to her, but mm -hmm. uh, it didn't work out very well. Mm -hmm. Well, what I wanted to share, what was so relatable to me in that, in that part of, of the book and that, that particular story. And it, you know, it's just a page and a half, maybe, you know, it's pretty quick. It's just this, this quick flash of where you were at that time. And, uh, you know, but you are also very descriptive in how you felt and how you, wanted to please her and all of these things. And my uh, connection to that was that my mother would, uh, she would play the piano. Uh, she had many talents. She had many musical talents uh, and, and other things. My grandmother actually had a ballet studio in Tallahassee, Florida um, for many years. And so there was music and dance and art and all of these things in my life too. But I remember being around 10 or 11 years old and my mother, what I, what my recollection is, and we're going to talk about the rear view mirror here in just a second, but what my recollection of that moment is, is that she quote unquote forced me onto the stage to perform in a talent show and sing while she accompanied me on piano. And I just remember thinking, 
at the age of 10 or 11. I was like, is this about her or is this about me? I don't want to sing. I'm not a singer. She picked the song. She did all of the things. She's like, this is what we're doing. We you, will were a, do you, were a, you were a prop in her performance. That's what I felt like. Yeah. That's what I felt like. And I think that that is, and I'm not holding any animosity toward that memory now at all. Um, but uh, gosh, I just remember how I felt in that moment. I remember exactly what I was wearing. I remember how squeaky my voice was because I just didn't want to be there. I just didn't want to be there. I didn't want to sing that song. I didn't want to do that thing at all. But the reason I included that scene, Mm because I I wrote a lot of things that didn't end up in the in the final book was really because not not that she forced me, but the the real significance was it was about gaslighting. It was it was after it happened. And I tried to confront her about it in my own kind of tentative way. Mm -hmm. And she basically said it never happened. And, yeah. you know, it, we're, we're right now in our country in a place where we're surrounded by so much gaslighting and so much false narratives. And every day to grow every day and to grow up with that, where you're told you didn't experience that. Mm-hmm. You don't feel that way. Mm-hmm. I know you better than you know yourself. These are the kinds of things that I heard. Yeah. It, it took me many, many years to find my own autonomy Mm-hmm. my own power and to to recognize and honor my own truth because you know your parents are so much more powerful than you are they're they're gods to you when you're a, ch- a child they are yeah. so when when your parent god tells you that something didn't happen um, and mm-hmm. that you don't feel that way you know and that you're wrong uh, mm-hmm. all the time um i just was so confused i was because i wanted to trust myself but i learned i couldn't trust my own perceptions even mm-hmm. So, you know, it's a long road back from that. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't, my mother was not a malicious person. I don't think she had a malicious bone in her body. Right. Uh, but, but she was very reactive and she loved the limelight. And yeah. whatever helped shine more light on her, um, including her children, um, that's what we were there for. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's talk about letters because, you know, there are a lot of letters uh, shared in your story and your mom kept letters and you kept letters. You, you both kept letters over the years, even during your time of estrangement, like that was especially especially during that, especially during that time, you know, of course you didn't have technology in, in, in that kind of thing, but I mean, how powerful is it also to see, um, something handwritten, when you look back on it and there's one in particular that I, I want to ask you about because you did mention this in your book, this, this letter that you kept reading over and over from your mother. And this was during a time when you were doing um, uh, speaking engagements and promotions for the courage to heal. Right. And you had this letter from your mother that you kept reading over and over again. Why? Why? Why that letter? Um, the letter was very angry. Um, the letter was attacking me. You know, the letter was basically saying I was a liar and um, I was I was doing what I was doing, which is, you know, basically outing her father on national TV, that I was doing it to destroy her. Mm-hmm. And you know, I think I, I, that stage in my life, so I was probably 32 years old then, because I think it was about a year after The Courage to Heal came out, and I was on the lecture circuit talking about healing from sexual abuse, and I had been, you know, basically, fam- I was famous for the worst thing that had ever happened to me. It, it was a very kind of um, challenging way to suddenly be in the public eye, especially because I was still so deep in my own healing process. Yeah. So on one hand, I had the world. You know, I had women would line up around the block to hear me speak. And I spoke to these packed auditoriums um, who, where women were hanging on my every word because I was giving them hope that they could heal. And so I had that going on. And simultaneously, my mother, I had this letter that I carried around um, that was, it was almost like it was red hot. 
you know, and it was sort of yeah. like, I, I wish I could have just let go of it, but instead, and I, I promised myself, I'm not going to read it again. I'm not going to read it again. And then I would just kind of compulsively read it again. And um, it was just so devastating. The breach between us was so devastating and her hostility and judgment were so um, devastating to me. Mm -hmm. And she still was this incredibly, like, she was like the sun. She was this burning force in my life. And the fact that she was um, devastated by what I had done and then so enraged um, was something I carried with me all the time. So there was this schism going on. To mm -hmm. the world, I was this almost like a savior. I mean, I was yeah. I was the the model. I was the poster child for healing from sexual abuse. And when I got up on the stage, I would definitely experience that. You know, in my real life, I felt like I was this screwed up incest survivor who was broken at that point. I don't feel that way now at all. But at that right. point, I still felt kind of broken and damaged. And then when I'd get on the stage, it would be like I would be filled with this inspiration and this grounding. And I felt like I was drawing energy up from the earth and down from heaven, <laughs> from the heavens, and that I something would fill me that enabled me to pass this, carry on this message and to to like this power, I felt, it, I felt like I was meant to do that. And I was meant to deliver this message. And I, you know, I don't know, maybe a lot of people who speak have this experience, but it, it was very, it was like being lifted up. And I think a lot of performers talk about that. They get, they get hyped up before a show and then afterwards they crash. And that's what I would experience. I would, I would give these talks. I would sign books. I would make contact with each person in that line. And mm -hmm. I would, that they would, tell me something about their story and I would sign their book with some personal message to every single person. Mm -hmm. And this, these lines went on for hours. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would be dropped off in a hotel room in some city. I couldn't even remember where I was and I would be alone and I would be convinced that I would be alone forever, that I was broken. And as soon as I took off the makeup I wore on the stage and the, the fancy clothes I wore on the stage, um, I would just deflate and I would be, uh, back to being feeling wounded. I, I used to describe feeling like this little dot floating around in the universe, disconnected from everything. Yes. And that's when I would pull out this letter because it reinforced that feeling of separation. And, and it was, you know, I was a bad person. I was doing something terrible. I was, you know, hurting my mother. And, and I, part of me believed what she was telling me about myself. Mm -hmm. um, but mostly, you know, underneath all of that, when I look at it now, you know, with a distance of many, many decades, right. I was longing to be connected to her. You know, no matter how much rage she threw at me, I longed for her. And so there was there was always this like push pull of putting up these boundaries and saying no to her, but underneath, um, really hoping and wishing and never admitting that someday we could actually be connected. I just find it so fascinating that the letter from her that you pull out and look at, at a time like that, when you are, you know, depleting yourself, when you are giving all of your energy into this is one that is so oh, further depleting, right? I mean, emotionally, emotionally. I, I think the other thing I, I want to say before we move on from the letters is that, um, when I read these, you know, after she died uh, and I was going through her things, I found this shoebox of letters mm -hmm. and I had kept my own set of letters. So yeah. when I put them together, it was a pretty complete record of our correspondence. And it was it was mostly through these years that we were really struggling with each other. Yeah. Um, and then I think, you know, the, the correspondence kind of petered out when the Internet came to be. Mm -hmm. And also we were communicating more. So there was no, you know, we were able to have phone calls and eventually visits and um, there wasn't that need to write letters, right. uh, but I'm really glad they existed. But it was yeah. very challenging for me to read them. And the reason is that the evidence, the written evidence, and, and it would be like the, the letters, they smelled like mildew and mold. And I mean, it was just like this whole sensory experience to read them. And I would force myself to sit in the chair. And I was sitting in the chair I had bought her a week before she died, this recliner that I got for her in her last assisted living and I had carried it back to my house and I would sit in that chair. This was, you know, maybe a year or two after she died. So I was really actively grieving and I would force myself, like, you're going to sit here for one hour 
and you're going to read these letters. Mm -hmm. And what was so hard about it was that I had to accept that I had told so many stories about her over the years that had demonized her. And yeah. I had, you know, said, we didn't speak for seven years. And then I, I in these letters, there were letters we wrote during that time. So yeah. my stories had really been exaggerated to mm -hmm. bolster what I needed to believe. Mm -hmm. And the evidence in the letters contradicted a lot of my own stories. So it was, it was quite painful. Um, and what I saw was there were definitely letters like that one, which were very hostile, but there were also so many letters that were loving and generous yeah. and full of good advice. And I had forgotten all of that. Yeah. So it was I really a reckoning with myself about the vagaries of memory and how I had created a story that fed my narrative. Yeah. And what was it going to be like to actually find the real truth? Mm -hmm. You know, what was the story beneath the story that I had been telling? Mm. And I think that's one reason it took me so long to write The Burning Heart of Two Stars is that um, The Burning Light of Two Stars is because it took me a long time to get down to that level of truth mm -hmm. uh, where I could get step away from what I had thought, yeah. what I had created and and face my own um, need to generate a picture that wasn't 100 percent true. I mean, everything I said was true, but it was only part of the truth. And so for me, the process of writing the book was, how do I discover the rest of the truth? And, you know, I'm not sure I found it all. Like if I was to write this book 10 years from now, I think I would be telling a different story because yeah. I'm always learning more. I'm yeah. always deepening my capacity to understand my own life and her life. And, and, and it's, you know, I think one of the things about, I talk about reconciliation a lot. And I think one of the things about it is we have to to get beyond just kind of the small relationship like between me and my mother is, is very kind of small and I started looking at the generations before us I started looking at the context of her life I started looking at the the epigenetics of the trauma that had been experienced by my ancestors that had been passed down mm -hmm. and suddenly she was like one link in a chain that went way back into history and that is continuing through my children and grandchildren and it made me see her in such a different light and yeah um, it was really the root of a lot of compassion and understanding because you know we we all are who we are for good reason you know even if we're doing terrible things there's 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 things that have created the conditions that led to the choices we make um, and the limitations that we have Yes, this is this is so good. And I think it's a good segue into talking about, again, the rear view mirror, right? There's a particular quote that you use, right? Every time I look in the rear view mirror, the past has changed. Now that came from uh, one of my students, Deborah Fruche, who's a writer. And I she read that she said that in a class exercise one day, and it was like that line has always stayed with me. Wow. Uh, um, every time we look in the past, every time we look in the rear view mirror, the past has changed because yeah. it's so true. You know, if, if when I was 27 years old, you know, if you had asked me, who are you? I would have said, I am an incest survivor. I mean, I was like shouting it from the rooftops. It was so huge in my consciousness mm -hmm. because I had just remembered what had happened to me. You know, mm -hmm. I had, I had suppressed these memories um, for in self-defense as a, as a young girl. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I would have said. I, I probably couldn't have identified with anything else. It was just so dominant. And, you know, now if you were to ask me who I am, it wouldn't even be on the list. You know, yeah. I would say, you know, I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother, uh, I'm an author, I'm a teacher, I'm a sister, mm -hmm. I'm a friend, I'm a mahjong player, I'm a swimmer. You know, there, there are so many other things I am. An incest survivor, I, I wouldn't even occur to me to yeah. claim that as an identity. It's not that it didn't happen. Yeah. It's that it's, it's it, when I look in the rear view mirror now, it's, it's woven into the fabric of who I am. And it certainly has influenced my life in many ways. And in some ways it has helped me develop strengths that mm -hmm. I wouldn't have had otherwise or might mm -hmm. not have had otherwise. And it's also given me some vulnerabilities that I probably will have to the day I die. So it, it, it definitely is part of the 
the deep history. It's like the mulch that I grew from mm. was that. But it doesn't need to be named anymore. It's just like, you know, we have yeah. a compost bin in our backyard. It's like <laughs> the orange peel and the onion, you know, they become dirt. Oh, they, wow. They're no longer what they were before. And, and so, and, you know, certainly in terms of the way I view my mother, uh, it's so different now than it was in the past. And, and, you know, each decade, I probably had a very different relationship with her. And I think mm -hmm. that's, that's the incredible benefit of relationships that last through your whole life cycle mm -hmm. is that you, you know, I, one of my books was called, I thought we'd never speak again. Yes. Um, and it was yes. kind of a, a how to book about reconciliation mm -hmm. uh, that I wrote about 20 years ago. And I, I, I thought we'd never speak again. That's what people say all the time, Yeah. but you really don't know. Um, I mean, right. you know, sometimes it's just absolutely impossible the person is violent, the person is dead, the person is mental illness, you know, the person is tox way too toxic to ever want to be in their presence again. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes people change in ways that we just can't anticipate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you were talking in the beginning about your your grandmother and your great grandmother and how mm -hmm. their, their Alzheimer's changed them in ways that, in different ways that you couldn't have anticipated. Right. So, you know, we just don't know. And I, I, one person um, I interviewed for the, the earlier reconciliation book, she she had very um, abusive parents who had abused her and then her children. And she had every reason to never, you know, ever have any in-person contact with them again or even any other contact because they were just completely closed. Mm -hmm. But the way she described it, she said, I've closed the door, but I've left the porch light on. Oh. And I just, oh, wow. that really touched me so much, you know, and, and I've used that myself when I've had a falling out with someone, you know, with a friend, something goes south and, mm. or, or you're ghosted by somebody or you ghost somebody. And mm -hmm. um, I, I've always liked that. Close the door, but leave the porch light on because I, I have found that there are surprises mm. in life. I, I may change in ways that I can't anticipate. And yeah. the other person may change in ways that you can't anticipate either. And, and you just don't know what's going to happen. Exactly. I mean, it's like one of my favorite quotes, and I, I, I think it's I, I, I think it's attributed to Buddha is, you know, holding on to resentment is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. Right. Right. There's a there's a there's a Yiddish saying that okay. is uh, when you go out for revenge, dig two graves. Mm. <laughs> Pretty much, you know, saying the same thing. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, yeah. I don't, I don't mean to. I think anger is really important. Like, I anger and yeah. rage is a really important part of the healing process. Agree. You don't want to skip over the anger and get to like uh, now. I'm going to forgive. I mean, I, I really oh. hated when people would push that down my throat. No. Um, but there is a. I, I did get to a point where I had raged. I had grieved. I had remembered. I had spoken out. I had gone through all these stages. Yeah. And I got to a point where I didn't want to be identified by my trauma anymore. Like I mm. wanted to know who am I without this as an identity? Yeah. You know, who am I without blaming everything that goes wrong in my life on the fact that this happened to me when I was a child? Right. And that was actually a very scary, this happened in my 30s. It was, it was a scary um, precipice to leap over. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember these two women, I two sisters I interviewed for The Courage to Heal. This had to be you know, 35 years ago. And they were from, a, had been very severely abused and really in extreme situation. And they said that they had, you know, kind of held it up like a flag for all these years. And then they said they got to the point where they felt like they were wearing a sweater that was too tight. And they, they desperately wanted to take that sweater off, which, which was their identification with being victims. Mm -hmm. And, but it was terrifying to take it off. But they they had to take it off, and I I got to that point too where I had to take off that identity, um, and I had to say, think about okay who do I want to be now? Yeah. It's almost like it's not a clean slate, but it's like starting over, and who am I just with what I create for my own life? Mm -hmm. um, it's not that these other forces won't still influence me, but I'm making choices now, and it's not in reaction to what happened to me. It's right. because I want to I want to start to develop who I was meant to be. Yeah. And not just not just live my life in response to the bad things that happened or even the good things that happened, not to yes. live my life in response to, but to start being empowered to make choices that that's really um, a really important part of healing is is getting to that point where it's like, OK, now what now what do I want to 
do with the rest of my life. Powerful was running through my brain, as you said, empowered. So wonderful. Yes, wonderful. And acknowledging that every human has his, her, their own experience as they go through these things, right? There's not a recipe. It's not a recipe that you follow to say, oh, you know, it's like grief. It's, you know, uh, anything. It's just what we do. It's what works for you. It's acknowledging that it's working through your own pain process and yes, getting angry and allowing that in, allowing that anger in. Um, yeah, so good. Uh, one thing that I did want to bring it back to your mom and her transition, because really, well, this, this entire book is about your transition, her transition. It's, it's about that. It's about all of the relationships. There's, you know, one part in that where you said, I remembered all the stories I'd read about people dying, their transit from one realm to the next, eased by shamans, psychics, gurus, and healers. I didn't qualify. I had no spiritual powers. I was just her daughter, a middle-aged woman with a shoddy meditation practice. <laughs> that quote. Whew, that particular, that hit me for some reason. Let's talk about that. You're not qualified to help your mom through her transit. Yeah, I think, you know, we are, my, my parents are both dead now. And, you yeah. know, one of the things is you don't get to practice for the death of your parents. Like no. when it happens, you're, you're like, there's no rehearsal. Yeah. Uh, and, and I don't, I think even if you've helped other people die or, you know, been in the, in the process of, of, of having someone you care about, um, you know, go through an illness or die, um, it's really different when it's your parents because they brought you into the world. Um, yeah. And, and so, yeah, I, I, I remember that feeling so well of like, I wasn't doing it right. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, at that point I wanted to do everything right. And I didn't know what right was. And uh, I, you know, I'm not going to go into the details because I want people yeah. to read the story, but I, I remember that and that, the, the, the um, that feeling of inadequacy about, I don't have all the requisite skills yeah. to help in this situation. Yeah. And um, I, yeah, I, I remember I, I was a lot, I felt a lot of anxiety, you know, as I was sitting at her yeah. deathbed, I, I really felt like I'm not doing this right. Yeah. I don't know what to do. You know, I wanted to share that because I think it's so very important to share that in that. Um, yeah, I'm not doing this right. Oh my God. It just is, uh, just, just thinking about that thinking because there are so many, um, I don't know, uh, coaches and midwives and that kind of thing with, with, with a birth, with, you know, with the, with the, you know, with introducing a life into the world. And, you know, of course there is an entire industry, if you will, around, uh, around the other side of it, of life. But as you said, it's your parents, like there is disconnection and there is, probably always this underlying feeling of, am I doing this right by them? No matter what, no matter what has happened, no matter what that relationship has been. And, you know, all of those years, that kind of thing. There's also, you know, when you when your parent dies, it, it's like whatever you had hoped would happen, it's too late for it to happen. Yes. I mean, although I, I absolutely, my relationship with my mother has continued after she died. Yes. You know, I mean, I, really very much so because I've been writing this book about her for 10 years, but seven years since she died, I've been yeah. immersed in 
thinking about her mm-hmm. and um, channeling her her dialogue, you know, and her voice and remembering yeah. her and doing everything I can to bring her presence into me so I can accurately reflect her uh, on the page. But so I, in some ways, I feel like, yes, I am still evolving in my relationship with her, you know, Absolutely. but it's, it's, it's one sided, you know, I mean, yeah. I'm the one who's here. Yeah. Um, so I think I think we keep growing, but there's a way that you know when someone dies, it's so final. On yeah. one hand, it's final. On the other hand, yeah, I, I've I've talked to many people who have said that they, it's it's really interesting. People who had very rough relationships with parents or with anybody, um, it could be a child, it could be a sibling, that when that person dies, they feel free to love them, mm. in a way that they couldn't while they were, they didn't feel safe enough when they were alive, mm. but after they die, they can begin to bring in again that person's positive qualities because they're not having to fend them off Mm -hmm. they're not having to create a barrier Mm -hmm. so I I think that's pretty interesting for sure and I what I have come to learn is that our relationships are really developed in our minds right so yes it is entirely possible to carry on a relationship with someone who is no longer living uh, and and evolve that relationship. So I think it is fantastic that you are doing that with your mother now still. Uh, Do you feel closer to her now? Okay. So it's been seven years. Yeah. It's been seven years. Uh, Do you feel closer to her as, I mean, or, or, or is that a, I can't really relate to closer. I I feel, um, it, it feels more like she lives inside of me. And, okay. you know, when I was young, I would say yeah. she lived inside of me in a really negative way. Mm-hmm. She was the, she was the critical voice. Mm-hmm. She was the voice tearing me down and telling me I wasn't doing it right. Or, you know, I was disappointing her. or I was wounding her. Or, so she, she was inside of me in a, in a negative way. I wanted to exercise her. Mm-hmm. And now I feel like she's inside of me in a wonderful way, you know, like I I do things and I say things and I smile because it's, I feel like I'm channeling, um, I'm manifesting some of her best qualities. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel this, um, that there's this loving presence, um, that is really looking at me and my life and, and the ups and downs with a lot of love and compassion. I, I, I think, you know, I don't know if she's still out there, but I, uh, it's just a feeling of this presence that is loving and compassionate and no longer bound to her personality and all the entanglements of that personality. Yeah. That's how I experience her now. And, mm. you know, I, when I cook things that uh, she taught me to, we used to cook together yes. a lot. I yes. cook things she taught me to cook. I think about her. And I also, when she died, she, she had a lot of beautiful things for the kitchen. Mm-hmm. like serving dishes and, um, you know, oil pours and, mm-hmm. you know, fancy napkin rings. Just And I kept a lot of those things. Gotcha. And I love yeah. having them in my kitchen. And I love, you know, I have a couple lamps of hers. I have some artwork of hers. Yeah. I love seeing her things in my house. Yeah. It just gives me a lot of pleasure to um, feel like I have her aesthetic sense and that I, I'm carrying her with me. Mm. I love it. I love that. I just want to touch on ever so briefly, all of the other relationships, because this, you know, this book, again, the heart of this, at the heart of this is your relationship with your mother. There are also all of these other, if you will, entangled relationships with your children, your, eventually your grandchildren, your wife, your brother, your, your aunt Faye, you know, all of those. How have those relationships evolved as a process of you writing this book and going through this experience? Well, I, you know, talk about my immediate family that were the ones, my Aunt Faye has died since yeah. this, this book came mm-hmm. out. Um, so I don't have any relationship with her anymore, but uh, she was my mother's generation. Um, mm-hmm. So that generation has passed. Yeah. But, you know, I, I wrote about my wife um, and my three kids and a little bit about, tiny bit about my granddaughter. Um, mm-hmm. And I was very careful about that because I, in my 30 plus years, 35 years of being a, a writer and publishing, 
I have gotten into some hot water with my family about writing about them. Mm -hmm. um, columns I've written, things I've published. And I have gotten to the point where I realize that I care more about the relationships than I do about what I'm publishing. And okay. that was not easy for me because mm -hmm. I'm a writer, you know, and I want to write and I want to publish and I want to have people reading what I've, I've written. Mm -hmm. um, but when I got to this book, I knew that um, I wanted them to support this project. So, you know, I talked to, it was mostly my brother, my spouse and my kids about what I was going to do. Mm -hmm. um, and they all were really supportive of me doing it. And I didn't show them anything for years and years and years. It's not like I shared what I was doing while I, but when I got to the end, um, you know, like nine years into it and I had, mm -hmm. which was pretty much a final draft, I wanted them to read it. And for a yeah. couple of reasons, first of all, I wanted them to tell me if I had, if there was anything inaccurate because, you know, memory is uh, very yeah. challenging uh, as a source of information. Yeah. And uh, so I wanted, or they might have remembered additional things. Like they might've remembered something about a particular scene that then I could work into that scene that would just give it a little more life. Um, and I also wanted them, I said, I want you to tell me if there's anything you can't live with that I've written about you. Mm -hmm. um, I, so it wasn't like giving them carte blanche. It was yeah. like, if it really matters to you, uh, I want you to tell me. And I, I gave them each a manuscript and I told them they had a month to read it. And I just sweated out that month. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I ended up getting, um, you know, I, I think what's hard is that when I'm an author, I'm a very public person, but everyone in my family is a very private person. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's really challenging to have a writer in the family. And so I, I've come to learn that over the years. And I feel like they give me a lot of latitude because they honor who I am and how I express myself in the world, which is through words. And, and I'm, I'm not a private writer or solely a private writer. I'm a public writer. I've published seven books. Um, I've been a columnist. I've, I've put words out in the world a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and and my, my, um, my oldest son is a um, video producer. And, and his feedback was really interesting because he, he looked at it as a story and he gave me some really great advice based on his perspective as a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. So that's what I got from him. Um, he wasn't in the book very much at all. So yeah. I mean, there was very little for him to give permission about. Yeah. Um, and then my two younger children both read the manuscript twice very avidly. They were fascinated by it. And they, even though I told them a lot about my life, they learned a lot about me. Yeah. And they, they wrote tons of margin notes and some of them were really funny and they were like, oh my God, I can't believe you did this or <laughs> really mom, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, and then they corrected some things um, and, and they, you know, they, they, they told me a few things that they would like me to change, tiny things, yeah. you know, uh, inaccuracies or, um, but they were okay about me writing about them. Yeah. I think, and, and, you know, and then my, my spouse, I think it was the hardest for her mm -hmm. because she's very, very private. And so what I did mm -hmm. is I really minimized her presence in the book. That's how I dealt with it. I mean, I couldn't not have her be there. She was, right. she was there for this whole story. But yeah. if you, if you read the book, it's definitely not an intimate portrait of her. She's not, right. she's not a, a three-dimensional developed character. And that was very intentional. Mm -hmm. It was a way to shield her Mm -hmm. and protect her and I feel like her her saying yes was amazingly generous mm -hmm. because she would really love not to be written about yeah but she loves me and she knew who she was getting involved mm -hmm. with when we got together I mean I was already a published author when we met so she knew yeah this is who I am and that I, I do write about my life so I felt like that was very generous on her part um and my brother uh also was really supportive he he always says you know mom would love this book um, and he did want me to change some things. I think he, I had created him really a lot as my foil. You know, he's he's an obstacle to me at many yeah. points in the story. Yeah. And when he read it, he said, you know, I'd really like you to say more nice things about me. Of and course. I, I was very touched by that. So and it was actually really easy to do because there were a lot of positive things. So I went back in the final draft and I I added more positive things about him. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I and so they all you know, basically signed off on it and, and uh, you know, went to press. Now, I have other relatives who are not in the book, um, who I did not tell them anything about it. I did not ask their permission. And there's probably a little pod of people who are going to be very upset by this book. They already are because I've told them it's coming. Mm -hmm. um, and they're the same relatives that were horrified when I published The Courage to Heal, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. I'm basically bringing up the same material that 
I, I had just carefully not talked about for like 20 or 30 years. Yeah. But I, I, I felt like I, I was never, I was my, I didn't publish for 19 years. Mm. And in part, it's because these stories that I wanted to tell, I felt I was not allowed to. I mean, allowed to by myself. I didn't want to rock the boat yeah. with these relatives that I had reconciled with. But ultimately, I got to the point of realizing I needed to tell the story. It was mine to tell. Yeah. It was pushing on me for 10 years. Yeah. And that it was going to touch, you know, tens of thousands of people who could resonate with, you know, what is it, what is it like to take care of an older person who has betrayed you in the past? You know, mm -hmm. is it possible to reconcile a damaged relationship? Mm -hmm. you know, is it possible to open your heart when you have every reason to keep it closed? These are very human questions. And I, I knew I was dealing with things that were kind of at the core of human experience and that it was not just a story about my family. It was, we were the vehicle, but that I was talking about things that I knew would resonate with lots of people. Yes. And although I am sorry that there may be you know, a dozen people out in the world whose life is going to be harder because I chose to publish this book. I ultimately did decide to publish. And I, um, when I, the day I signed the book contract, I wrote to those relatives and I informed them. I didn't ask permission. I informed them what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And I basically apologized. You know, I said, I know it's really hard having a writer in the family. I'm, I'm sorry for any pain that my decision is bringing up for you. And, and I hope that this doesn't lead to you know, another estrangement because we don't have another 20 years to work it right. out again. Right. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's like, an, you know, writing memoir is, mm -hmm. uh, it's challenging on that front. And I, I've, I, because I'm older now, I care about these people. It doesn't matter who's right and who's wrong. Right. It's not like, oh, I have a right to tell the story. It's if, if what I do, if my actions hurt someone, I'm sorry about that. But your motive, if you will, for lack of a better word, your, your motive is to help so many others out there. That's why you are telling your story. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, yeah. you know, my writing students, often when someone comes with a story, the first draft or the early drafts, I call it like the revenge draft. Mm -hmm. you know and it's like they're they're it's all about them being the hero and someone wronged them and that person is like evil and bad and it's like right yes that's very ther could be therapeutic mm -hmm. it's a good place to start but you know if you want to publish a story that people will read uh you need to get beyond that you need to really create fully human characters so that mm -hmm. I love it when someone says you know on this page I hated you and I loved your mother and on this page I loved your mother and I hated you right that's when I know right. I did a good job yeah yeah it's true it's true and I I will add that you know uh for Karen your your wife I you yes you did I I got that you minimized her character throughout but I also got in the little snippets that you shared, how very supportive that she was for you and your family throughout this experience. So uh, well done. So well done. Yeah, she really was, a, uh, in terms of my relationship with my mother, she was always advocating for my mother yeah. and advocating yeah. against my habitual story <laughs> about how difficult my mother was. And she, she would defend my mother. And I really mm -hmm. appreciated that. Mm -hmm. You know, she, she enjoyed her, you know, everyone enjoyed her. It just was hard to be her daughter. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's it. Right? Everyone else was like, oh, I wish I had your mother as my daughter. I wish she was my mother. And I was like, well, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if my daughter says the same. I hope not. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, this has been such an amazing journey. I, I thank you. I really and truly thank you for sharing your story with the world. It's one of many stories that you've already shared, but this, this one in particular, this mother daughter memoir, so, so very powerful and raw and real and all of the things. So I thank you. I thank you for putting that out there. I thank you for sharing that with me and our listeners today. And uh, if anyone would like to connect with you otherwise, uh, so, so the book is going to be available where? Just wherever books are sold? Amazon? Yeah, it's, it's, and, like, it, it, 
it's coming out in paperback, in audiobook. I recorded the audiobook myself, which was mm -hmm. a, 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 quite an interesting journey to yeah. learn how to do that. Um, and then it's a, it's also a, an, an ebook. So any, anywhere books are sold, mm -hmm. you know, I, I always try to encourage people to buy through your local independent bookstore. Buy local, um, yes. Mm -hmm. Buy local if you can. And um, what I've done is I've posted the first five chapters of the book on my website. Mm -hmm. um, so you could read them. Um, mm -hmm. It's a much more of a taste than you would get on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And that's at uh, lauradavis.net mm -hmm. forward slash chapters. Uh, lauradavis.net forward slash chapters and you can just read the opening and then at the end it links to all the different places that you could buy the book so you know if you get hooked on the story and you want to keep reading you just click on all those buttons uh, there's you know the bookshop which is the independent stores there's amazon there's mm -hmm. barnes and noble you know all the places you could buy it uh, mm -hmm. it's there all right anything else any parting words uh, you know, just, you know, if you want to find me and find out about my teaching of writing, uh, anything else about the other things I do, just come to lauradavis.net and all my social media links are there as well. Yes, I will attest to that. You do have a very robust website. I appreciate all of the um, references that are contained within. So wonderful. Thank you so, so much for being with us today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. My goodness, this woman inspires me so much. She makes me want to write a book. Whew. I love that she shared how delicate a dance it can be to write about family. We actually had a little bit more of a conversation around that aspect after we stopped recording. Laura facilitates writing workshops and retreats, and I'm sure she inspires so many that she crosses paths with. I am honored to have encountered her for sure. Now, this book is self-published, which means she doesn't have a team marketing this for her. This is a grassroots endeavor. So I want you to head over to her website, lauradavis.net, to connect and learn more about her work. And of course, to order your copy of The Burning Light of Two Stars. You can download the first five chapters from her website to get a taste. As she said, you can find it wherever books are sold, though we encourage supporting indie stores. We want you to tell your book club about it. And I want you to share it with your family and your friends. Share this episode with your friends. This is a story that deserves to be heard far and wide. It truly is a life-changing read. I will drop links in the show notes. Thank you so much for hearing us both today. Light up, shine on. 